We're running low on water, supplies. The men are tired. If we can't beat this bunch, we might as well give up. It's been 47 days now. Damn it! That's how long their general said it would last. I got it from one of the prisoners. I heard. Don't you just love the Romans? I know I do. That's a short clip from a BBC documentary on ancient Rome, and that's Vespasian talking about those pesky Jews that he's trying to put down in the First Revolt in 66 AD. And most importantly, he's talking about that strange prisoner general, Josephus, who makes all these amazing predictions. Boy, oh boy, I don't know where to begin, folks. You're going to hear a lot on this history of Josephus, Vespasian, the fake, fake history that's told to us that can be demonstrated is fake and can be demonstrated has some deep, deep implications for what the real history probably was. It would take a long time to fill in all the gaps, and I can't really do it here. You're going to get bits and pieces like you normally do in this show, and maybe you can help guide me towards how we can compile this into something meaningful. Maybe you can even help. Maybe you know more about these topics than I do. There are many of you out there that I know have some very specialized knowledge. But I have a terrific interview to kick off this series. It's with a gentleman I really like and respect, and I think he's written a great book that you'll enjoy, and he certainly has a fascinating story to tell about the Romans in America in the second century. And he has, I would say, overwhelming archaeological evidence, at least compared to the mainstream historical narrative, which I got to tell you, we didn't get into this with Dave, but like one little story he tells is he has all this solid archaeology that he's done, coins that he's found, forts that he's uncovered or the Army Corps of Engineers have uncovered, which date back to the second century, date back to being in the hands of the Romans, and date back to having connections with Jewish people. And what he faces in opposition to that research from the mainstream, the ordained history, is unbelievably ridiculous. Like, again, I was going to tell you this little story. Like, one of the explanations from mainstream history in terms of how these coins from the second century wind up in the Ohio Valley is, well, maybe a bird flew over, you know, it had the coin in his beak and dropped it. (laughs) How stupid is that? Yeah, maybe there was a, a flock of birds and they all had coins and they dropped them in and around the same place. Another explanation, this is from mainstream history, in order to prop up the ridiculous narrative that they need to promote on this, is maybe a coin collector went to the beach, (laughs) I can't even say, and lost his coins on the beach, and then they got washed up and they got found. Like, yeah, you know, hey, if we're going to the beach, uh, let me swing by my uh, safe deposit box at the bank and pick up my collection of golden Roman coins. Uh, what's, you know, it's funny, except that this really is kind of what we sometimes square up against when we're dealing with mainstream history and religious history, which we'll get later into on this topic. And I think we have to really uh, check ourselves and avoid even engaging in that discussion because it really is so stupid. And when you engage with that kind of stupidity, you can't look anything other than a little bit stupid yourself. As I said, there's a lot more to come on this topic, but I hope you enjoy this one with Dave Brody. So there's, there's a human element involved in this as well. But for whatever reason, I think the pieces fell together that day. It happened to be the right people making the right deal. There was enough treasure to, to grease the skids. They somehow knew where to go. Don't forget, the Roman legions were comprised of the conquered Phoenician and Carthaginian groups. So they, 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 they you know, they're like the Borg in Star Trek. They basically, they, they just take everybody in and that becomes who they are. And so 
to the extent they would have, the Ninth Legion, by the way, was based in the Iberian Peninsula. So they would have had plenty of members who have family experience as part of the, the Punic Wars and the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians and history of, of crossing the Atlantic and navigating all that. All those skills would have been part of the Ninth Legion. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome David Brody to Skeptico. Dave is an attorney turned historical fiction writer, author of multiple Amazon bestsellers and Boston Globe bestsellers, including his latest, which is probably headed in that direction, I think, Romerica, Roman Artifacts in America, which is a great fiction story, but also is kind of wrapped around this history or this, you know, kind of forbidden history kind of thing that there's a lot of evidence, archaeological findings and other historical evidence, highly suggestive of Romans being in America in second century. So this is kind of right up my recent interest in this ancient history. I'm of course interested in where that takes us in terms of consciousness and spirituality and some of these other things. But I was really, really impressed with, uh, with Dave's work, particularly what he brings as an, an attorney, someone who's used to kind of sorting through evidence translate as sorting through bullshit to get to the truth. So I just thought it was a great opportunity and I really enjoyed the book, which the book, by the way, you know, I just pulled it up. This is another one of those free read if you're on Kindle Unlimited. Now buy it, of course, buy Dave's book, but if you want to read it for free and if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can do that too. So uh, without any further... David Brody, welcome to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and thank you for the kind words. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. So tell us more about your background, who you are. All right, so I'm one of those you know, law school graduates, one of those lawyers who always wanted to be a, a fiction writer. There's a bunch of us who got, uh, as we graduated college, sort of got pushed off into either law school or you go get your master's degree in writing or you go to journalism school. Those are sort of the three options for English majors. And I went to law school, but I'd always wanted to be a writer. And over the years, I would sit down you know, on a weekend, try to do something. And finally, um, when my, my wife and I settled in, we had children, I started writing legal thrillers. And I had written three of those legal thrillers and was looking around for an idea for a fourth one. This was um, 2005, 2006 time period, living in a suburb of Boston, Westford, Massachusetts looking for an idea for what I thought was going to be a fourth legal thriller. And my daughter came home from school one day in the fourth grade and said, you know, I said, what would you do today? Of course. And there, she was young enough to actually give me an answer at that point instead of nothing. You know, she gave me the answer. And she said, we learned about the legend of Prince Henry Sinclair coming to America a hundred years before Columbus and coming to Westford, the town we lived in. And I was like, I, I had never heard of that, but it turns out there's a legend in, in our town of Scottish explorers, uh, basically island hopping their way across the North Atlantic, much as the Norse had done uh, in the early 11th century, uh, coming uh, down the coast from Nova Scotia, down past Maine and up the Merrimack River and into the Merrimack Valley. And as the legend went, one of the guys in this group, uh, his name was Gunn, James Gunn, uh, died. And to memorialize the death of this knight, the group carved an effigy of a knight into the rock ledge top the highest hill in the area. And that effigy still exists today. And there's a you know tourist marker and people come and visit and basically carved into the ledge. You can faintly make out a, a, a knight. But you can very clearly make out um, his sword, his battle sword. And that's the Westford Knight legend. And I started looking at other sites and artifacts that might be consistent with that legend. This, this is where the lawyer in me comes out. You talked about it earlier. To me, it's all about evidence. And if we're gonna have a legend like that, okay, legends are fun, but if we're gonna to try to rewrite history and talk about Columbus being a hundred years late to the party, then we should have other evidence. It's like trying to convince a jury of, of your case. You're not gonna be able to win the case with one piece of evidence, but if you have six or seven really compelling pieces, you can, you can win that case. And so I said, if, if they really were here, there should be other evidence for that. 
And, I, and so I went down that rabbit hole and quickly what I thought was gonna be my fourth legal thriller turned into a series of 11 fiction, historical fiction novels entitled the Templars in America series. And Romerica is the 11th in that series, really not having much to do with the Templars, but all of them relate to this whole concept of groups of European and Mediterranean explorers coming across the Atlantic prior to Columbus. The idea that the Atlantic Ocean was a highway and not a barrier. But as you said, it's all evidence-based. You've got these sites, you've got these artifacts, you've got these ancient maps, you got pieces of evidence and either we pay attention to the evidence or we sort of ignore it and, and put our head in the sand and, and, and wonder why we can't see. And that's why I'm here today talking to you about this stuff. I'm very passionate about it. Well, you know, that's awesome. And one of the things I really enjoyed about the book, and I think other people will too, is, you know, you, you have all these links at the end. I don't know how many pages in Romerica, this latest book, but 50, 60, it depends if you're reading it on Kindle, I don't know. But with all these links, you know? So here, uh, good historical links of ships around Plum Island. It, boom, you can link to it, and here those are. So what you've really done here is combining, sifting through the archeological work, the good historical work is out that it's out there, but you're also pointing out some of the kind of shoddy historical work that's out there. And particularly, I love the whole pre-Columbian idea because even the term pre-Columbian already kind of pigeonholes you as some kind of a conspiracy guy, you know, going against right. the grain kind of thing, rather than just, hey, what is the evidence about the earliest visitors to the Americas? Yeah, you make a good point. So when I started doing this, I started lecturing probably 12 years ago on the subject. And at that time, most people were skeptical to the possibility of anyone here before Columbus. We all grew up with, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and you know we celebrate Columbus Day in October. Uh, but over the past dozen years, that ocean liner really has redirected itself. And now people like you say things like what you just said, which is, why are we even propping up that whole Columbus thing anymore? So in half a generation, we've actually made a lot of headway. And now people realize yeah, the Norse were definitely here. And to me, I always say to people, look, we know for a fact the Norse were here in the early parts of the 11th century. Leif Erikson, all those Icelandic sagas, the Norse sagas, we know they were here. We know they came down at least as far as Northern New Finland. And now most experts say that Lonzo Meadow site was just a stopover point. They came down probably as far as Maine, New Brunswick, but we're, we're sure of at least New Brunswick. So they're right on the, right on the doorstep of New England already. To me, it would be more surprising if over the next 500 years after the Norse were here, that nobody came back. That's way more surprising than the idea that people did. Like to me, it's 500 years, there's great reasons to come over here, trading, uh, mining, cop, whatever it was, economic advantage, lots of all the land, you know, the, the land of, 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 of plenty. There's plenty of great reasons for coming over here. And it's part of the human condition to, to seek out new life and new civilization, as Star Trek says. And, and so, again, the idea that the Atlantic Ocean was a barrier during medieval times and before, that's a, that's a fiction that, you know, the church wanted people to be afraid of falling off the edge of the earth if they crossed the Atlantic. But that was because they wanted to maintain control. They, wanted, they didn't want people exploring and being scientific. But most educated people understood that there were, the earth was round and that there were other lands across the Atlantic. And, and this goes back to ancient Atlantis and whatever, but it goes way back. But again, to me, the takeaway, the surprising thing would have been if nobody came back between the Norse and 1492, that's almost 500 years, that would be surprising to me. Well, what I think is kind of really interesting where you went there a couple of ways, Dave, is one, you're pushing it way back. At least it seems to us you're pushing it way back and we'll dive into that in a minute, but because you're pushing it back to the second century and you're pushing right. it so, back so, to Rome. But let me just throw yeah, in so, a couple of things that I picked up from a, a, another interview that I heard you do, because you have a kind of broad knowledge of all this stuff that I want to kind of tap into. And that's that we, we've kind of moved from one kind of wacky paradigm that we shouldn't look before Columbus. 
and we've moved off of that. And now we've moved to the, oh, okay, we can look to kind of the medieval period, like you're saying, and the Norris did it, and you know, but, but we want to stop there when really we have no reason to stop there. Like you point out the Phoenicians who are the people in Lebanon, right? And they were great seafarers and they kind of sailed all around in boats bigger than Columbus. You could also point right. out that, you know, the whole Easter Island thing. I mean, that's a harder ocean to cross and you got all that. And then yeah. you got all the connections in South America. You also got all this other archeological evidence and archeological evidence that's popped up with, you know, uh, Pompeii is showing up with cannabis and uh, with uh, cocaine and with other products that only come from the Americas. As are even you go back to the to the Egyptians and the mummies, they're they're finding cannabis and cocaine. So really, the the fact that they've even been able to you know perpetuate this kind of slow roll it back begrudgingly give the Norse you know their little piece is kind of a more of the kind of controlled narrative and. So you kind of bust through that in kind of a really direct way and just say, well, clearly that's all out the window. I'm gonna focus on second century. And the reason you focus on it is because- You know, I didn't really bust through the door like you just said, I really, I sort of went through it very slowly as when it gets to the second century. So as I've been doing the research over the past 14 years about the medieval stuff, periodically I would find sites and artifacts that were older than that. Um, we'll talk about a lot of them as we go along today. And I would set them aside and say, that's an interesting curiosity. It's a, an outlier or a one-off or whatever it might be. And at a certain point um, about a year ago, I started looking at my, my pile of outliers and started realizing that an awful lot of them are second century Roman, like more than you would expect to just have random. And I started saying, huh, and, and it was about the same time my wife and I relocated to the North Shore of Massachusetts. And I started learning about uh, all, the, all the Roman era coins that had been found after major storms in the area. Uh, people would go out and metal detect out on a barrier island, Plum Island. And, and um, as you showed earlier, a, a link to shipwrecks. There's so many shipwrecks off of Plum Island. And I said, geez, all these Roman coins, where are they coming from? I mean, they probably weren't in a colonial ship. Maybe there's a Roman era ship out there that got disturbed during a storm and, 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 and coins that were sort of nestled in them got freed up and washed ashore. And that would explain why six or seven different places along the North Shore have, have people have found these Roman era coins around the second century. So again, there's, there's evidence. And if, if we have evidence, we either have to throw it away and say it's, it's, it's not credible, but if we do think it's credible, and in this case, I, I did think it was credible. There has to be a story behind it. How did it get here and why? And again, to go back to your question, it, I, 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 it took me a while, but I suddenly realized that there's a lot of it that is second century that I haven't I've been able to explain. And so now looking at it sort of freshly and saying, okay, maybe all the second century evidence tells a story. And that's how I ended up with, with the book Romerica. And again, I, I might have the details of that story wrong. I might have the story wrong, but there is a story to be told here. There is real evidence, real artifacts that have been scientifically proven to date back to the Roman era. There has to be an explanation for how they got here. They, they, didn't, they didn't swim across themselves. Well, it's a, it's a fun story, if you will. It's a fun book put in a, a, a narrative and it's storytelling. And you, you kind of bounce back and forth between saying, you know, stay with me for the story, it'll be fun. But what I'm really trying to do is sprinkle in all this important new history and archaeological stuff. Right. So talk a little bit about the story. It is part of a series, but it's not like somebody has had to read a bunch of the other books in the series. Talk about the book itself. Right, you, you read this one first, I'm guessing. You didn't read the other ones, I assume. You didn't have time. Yeah, so it, it, it's a, they're designed to be standalone. And, and basically the story, um, I was told uh, as a young author that the best way to be successful as a writer is to write in the genre that you like to read in. And I love to read historical fiction, you know, Clive Cussler, the thrillers based on historical artifacts, uh, Da Vinci Code type things. So I try to write in that genre too. So people say, well, why don't you write nonfiction, all these artifacts, all this history? And my response is, I think it's more fun to have a little spoonful of sugar as you're taking your historical medicine. And history can be fun, 
that can also be exciting. It can be a roller coaster ride. You can you can have really fun uh, a fun time with it, and that's what I try to do with this. You'll get plenty of history. You earlier, um, Alex, showed the all the footnotes at the end. You know, my law professor is really happy with me for putting footnotes at the end and my sources and stuff. Most fiction writers don't do that, but I want the readers to understand that the history and the sites and the artifacts that I'm writing about they're real and they're authentic, even though the story that carries a reader through the journey, the story itself is fictional, but, but the history that we're learning about is real. And so that's one of the reasons why I put the artifacts, uh, the footnotes at the end. And I also put, as you mentioned, pictures of all the sites and pictures of all the artifacts in, because I want the readers to understand these are real. We're looking at the, the, the terracotta, you know, if we're looking at a terracotta head from Mexico, I want the readers to see that. I'm not making that up. And when I say it dates back to a certain date, luminescence testing tells us it's second century, I'm not making that up. And that's why I put those footnotes in there because again, even though the story itself is fictional, the the, the historical parts of the story are, are authentic and real. Yeah, it was just popping up on the screen and maybe you wanna talk through. Uh, you have a, a number of uh, interesting photographs in the book. And then you also sent me some additional ones, you know, coins that have been found. And, and uh, right. we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, this is a fort shaped like a menorah, right? Um, we got a menorah and an oil lamp. That's a fort that was, and this is a drawing from the Army Corps of Engineers from 1823. This is a fort, uh, they call it Fort Works. Basically, you know, you, the fort itself is no longer there, but you can see that where the outline of, of the of the palisades would have been and whatnot, the 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 outline of the old fort. This is 1823 in Ohio. And for folks, just let me just interject for folks who can't see it because most people listen to this show and don't watch it. But right. uh, the the menorah is clearly, clearly can't be anything else in this drawing. And even the lamp uh <laughs> can't be anything else. So uh, this is gonna kind of launch us into a really interesting discussion. But again, I just wanted to emphasize 1824 Army Corps of Engineers. Where did you find this document? The internet's a great thing. I mean, I, I, a, a generation ago, Alex, you know, I couldn't have done this research. It would have been impossible. Just, you would have had to go down to Washington DC and, and, and crawl your way through the, through the stacks and microfiche and whatnot. But, Everything's been digitized now. And so if you want to look at Army Corps of Engineers drawings, you can go find them. And it's, it really has made, I get the question all the time, how come we're just learning about uh, second century Roman occupation or, or, or exploration of America? And I think the answer is the, the clues have always been out there, but no individual researcher has been able to put their hands around more than one or two pieces of it because it was also scattered and spread out. Now with the internet, someone like myself can come along and, and I can find 15 or 20 artifacts and sites in the matter of a few weeks on the internet. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, it would have taken me decades to do that. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, totally. I, I think there's a, another reason for it. It's the obvious reason is that, you know, there's a narrative that people are following. And uh, you know, if, if I want to switch a little bit from talking about this excellent book that I really do want people to uh, check out, Romerica, because the research I think you'll find, if you're at all intrigued by this point, half an hour into this interview, then you got to read the book because it's all there, <laughs> all the links are there, all the information's there. But I want to try and pull Dave in a little bit of a different direction, for selfish reasons, for this project that I'm doing, because. What intrigued me about Romerica was second century Rome and this strange relationship that it reveals about the relationship between the Roman military and uh, a kind of a breakout of that, the relationship between Judea and Rome. But also before we even get there, I wanna go back to what you just said. I, I'm really uh, suspicious because of my investigation in science is that to the extent to which this narrative is intentionally being controlled, which is really kind of obvious, we talk about the pre-Columbian thing, but even controlled in the sense that you couldn't have written this. I'm not so sure you could have written this as a nonfiction book. But you, certainly if you were an 
academic historian, you couldn't have written it. And, and That's very what, is, true. what does that say about just the state of academia in general? I've been more on the hard sciences, but in the soft sciences, it's even worse. I mean, it's just really kind of controlled, completely controlling the narrative. You're, you're hundred percent right about that. I could not have written this as an academic type unless I wanted to basically commit uh, um, professional suicide. I, mean, I, I would have been laughed out of the, the faculty lounge at whatever university that I happened to be working at at the time. And, and what's really telling, I belong to an organization called New England Antiquities Research Association. And, and what we do, we go out in the woods and, 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 do, and do this research. We look for these ancient sites and artifacts. And there's a few hundred people, at least in our organization, four or 500 people. And very, 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 very few of them, probably a minuscule number of them, are actual historians or archaeologists. Most of them are people like myself or like yourself who, who do this as a hobby because we're passionate about it. But the, but the people trained in history and archaeology want nothing to do with this. And this goes back to what you said, is, 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 is they're sort of in, uh, indoctrinated into these ideas. Uh, they learn them going through college. They are... are punished for thinking outside of that box when i say punished they're 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 not allowed to do a thesis on that subject if they do they're not going to be hired or get tenure they're basically herded along in a certain way to think the way uh their professors are thinking and it's hard to break out of that and, and i don't think it's necessarily because there is a conspiracy to keep the reality and the truth away from us i don't think that's what's happening I think instead it's just basic human nature that people have staked out a position, academics have staked out a position that certain things are the truth and certain things are reality. And they don't want to be proven wrong because they don't want to have egg on their face. And so they, they dig in their heels. Again, just human nature. They dig in their heels and they basically put their hands over their ears and close their eyes and say, I don't want to, you know, Sergeant Schultz, I see nothing, I hear nothing. Um, Again, it's not because there's a great conspiracy, but mostly just because people are selfish and don't want to have uh, have egg on their face, like I said. See, I, I, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but to me, the evidence of the conspiracy is evident in what you just said, in that at the, at the middle management level that you're talking about, yeah, there's no conspiracy. I, I control your job, dude. I control your tenure. <laughs> I control what conferences you go to or don't go to. It doesn't look, it doesn't have to look like a conspiracy to you. It just looks like you, you know, being able to go home and face your wife and say, yeah, I'm, we're going to still be able to make mortgage payments. But at a level above that, which you just, as you just talked about, you said the church wanted to control the narrative because they wanted to be in control. Well, that's conspiratorial and it clearly is. Right but now, as more and more it gets revealed today about how completely corrupt the church is, but we don't ever want to call the church on that. You know, we still have to walk carefully in science. You know, my thing has been this idea of controlling the narrative about consciousness, that there can be no extended consciousness, that any kind of spiritual experience that people are having is completely uh, a delusion. It doesn't happen. And the holding to that in the face of all evidence to the contrary is conspiratorial. It's a way to control and social engineer people. So I think this idea of when you look through the, all this stuff from the social engineering lens and, and, and start accepting that, and this is Rome, this is what I love about Rome, is that you know the Romans knew this 2000 years ago, that when you, about social engineering, about controlling the people as an alternative to dominating the people through war, we can dominate the people through beliefs and ideas and stuff like that. So we don't have to kind of agree on that or don't have to hash that out any further because let's get back to kind of the book a little bit indirectly. And that's that this story about second century Rome and Judea is just, it's a phenomenal, phenomenally important to our history to our present day history, because it's all about the forming of Christianity. It's all about the control of uh, the Jewish tradition and the Jewish religion and why it gets uh, 
pulled along in the whole thing. And, and it also points to a different way that the Romans thought about these different evolving religious ideas and religious traditions. So uh, uh, enough of me going on. What did you find out that is so stunning about this second century uh, uh, Romans? Right, so I mentioned earlier in the interview that there was a, a number of sort of pieces of evidence that I found that were clustered around the second century that I put aside over the years and, 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 and eventually came back to when, in writing this book. And one of them was um, a researcher in Indiana by the name of Rick Osmond, about 10 years ago, wrote a book about how uh, he had come across and documented a bunch of Roman era fortifications in the Ohio River Valley. And he came up with a theory that in the second century, and this is true, historians, this is mainstream historians, uh, that the, the, the ninth Roman legion, which was stationed at Hadrian's Wall between England and Scotland uh, in the second century, for some reason, that, that legion, which is probably 10,000 people, essentially disappeared. No one's quite sure what happened to that legion. And Rick Osmond speculated that perhaps that the, these forts in the Ohio River Valley were, were, related, were related to the legion, that for some reason, he didn't really put a finger on it. The legion decided to cross the Atlantic. Either they were blown off course or they came over here for a reason and ended up being the, the reason why there's so many Roman era artifacts and fortifications and coins in the Ohio River Valley. Well, I took it a little further, I did a little more research and I found that um, after leaving Hadrian's Wall uh, in the early parts of the second century, the Ninth Legion actually was redeployed to Jerusalem and then disappeared. What they were doing in Jerusalem was putting down something called the Barkovka Uprising, Barkovka Revolt, this is about 132 AD, your listeners may remember that in about 70 AD, we had something called King Herod's War, where Herod put down the rebelling Jews and the temple was, of Solomon was destroyed, the rebuilt temple was destroyed. About 70 years later, the Jews rose up again, and this time led by Simon Bar Kopka, uh, a freedom fighter, uh, Bar Kopka uh, being Hebrew for uh, son of the star, or also known as the comet, which is another word for son of the star. And the slogan for this, this uprising was a comet for the Jews, Bar Kopka, a comet for the Jews. That was the slogan. Um, so one of the possibilities, and we also know, by the way, that during this uprising, we know this from uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Copper Scroll of Qumran, uh, which is actually not, most of the scrolls are partial. This is on copper. And this scroll lists 70 or so locations of hidden temple treasure. Basically, as, as the Romans came in to put down the rebellion, the priestly families who were in charge of the temple said, we better hide our treasures and our, and our gold furnishings and whatever before the Romans come, and we'll retrieve them later. And so they, they made this list, um, carved it into copper, as to where these things were in case, you know, in case they weren't around to tell the survivors where to find all this stuff. Um, so one of the possibilities is, I'm, I'm picturing this whole scene, the Ninth Legion goes to Jerusalem, puts down the revolt, at some point, all the Jews are being either murdered or sold into slavery. And the priestly families say, time out, hold on. Ninth Legion, hold on, guys, wait, we got a deal for you. We've got about $1.5 billion, that's in today's money, worth of temple treasure. And we want to get out of here. We need our lives saved. If you take us with you out of Europe, out of the Mediterranean, away from the emperor, we'll give you the 1.5 billion. And that I thought may explain how they ended up collectively, the Romans and the Jews, because we have Roman artifacts and we have Jewish artifacts. Again, the Hanukkah fort, there's no reason for the Romans to build something like that. And we have other artifacts we can look at also. But that would collectively explain how we have Roman and Jewish artifacts in the Ohio River Valley in the second century. So that's, again, that's the fiction writer in me putting pieces together and that's speculative. I, I can't say for certain that happened. And that's why I say, you know, something happened. I'm not sure if I have it right. But that's definitely a possibility. The pieces of evidence support that possibility. Dave, what have you found out about the relationship between uh, the Romans and the, the various Jewish groups, the, the groups in Judea? Because a lot of people don't understand this, but uh, Judea, like all these client states in, in the Roman Empire, there's a lot of... Uh, 
kind of Vichy France thing going along, you know, like, hey, the Romans aren't so bad and look at all the good things and hey, let's give unto Caesar what is Caesar's kind of thing. So it's not right. like, the, so they have their rebellion flank and then they have their Herod, you know, give unto Caesar. So what is in this time period at this second revolt, what do you, do you, did you dig up anything interesting about the relationship there? Because what you're speculating about it is it, to me doesn't even sound like a timeout timeout it sounds like a hey guys here's an idea kind of thing you know well so the relationship with the romans and 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 the roman empire and the jewish groups this is all during a time period where uh and and, and the reason why jesus was able to start preaching and be welcome as a potential messiah the 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 prophecies were this was a time period where where a messiah would be coming and so it's a lot of upheaval in, in right around this time period and so there were different factions of, of jewish groups all looking for different things the romans come in and they either stir the pot or they play one side off the other and you know it, it's 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 a mess right now it's a time of upheaval and so we have we see these constant uh uprisings again herod's uprising and then bar Kokhba's uprising and by the time bar Kokhba's uprising is over Basically, there are no Jews left in Jerusalem. That, that's the end of it. But at, but at the same time, we, 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 we lose all the temple treasures, like the stuff that was supposed to be in Jerusalem, the, the golden menorah, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of true bread, the uh, Aaron's rod, the, the pot of manna. Uh, if, you go, uh, the, the, if you wanna go to the Christian side of things, the Holy Grail, the cross of Jesus was buried, uh, was crucified on. You know, none of those things have ever been found again. So. The Jews leave at around this time period, but so do all the artifacts, the religious artifacts from Judaism and Christianity. And some hey, of them Dave, ended up back in Rome. Can I interject a question there? Um, sure. And I just don't know this. What do we think happened to all those super valuable Jewish artifacts during, you know, Titus's sacking of uh, Jerusalem? Some of it gets gets bring back and they brought back to Rome and they parade down the, we've got the arch of Titus which shows the carving I think you just said that of some of the artifacts and but even those ones seem to have disappeared but that's not all of them that was the main one being the temple of shrewbread and the golden menorah and I use the golden menorah as, as a as sort of a, a plot device in my story um, because that's never been found you know no one knows where that is um, but others others of them you know, the rumors have it that the Ark of the Covenant uh, is in Ethiopia. There was a story a couple of weeks ago about a uh, militia group attacking the church in rural Ethiopia, trying to capture the the ark. And I've always laughed at that because if you if you know the World War II history and you know how obsessed Hitler was with finding the Ark of the Covenant, I mean we all saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's basically the Nazis trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Mussolini controlled Ethiopia during World War II. If the Ark of the Covenant was in Ethiopia in World War II. Mussolini's forces would have found it and given it to Hitler. I mean, that was there's no doubt about that. So I don't believe that the Ark is in Ethiopia being guarded by, you know, a handful of, of priests. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, if it's not there, you know, where is it? There's evidence that the Portuguese in medieval times went down to Ethiopia and may have taken it. And but then, again, where did it go after that? So so part of what makes writing fiction so much fun is because there's all these treasures that have never been found and 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 everyone loves a good treasure hunt everyone goes you know the, the curse of oak island on on history channel everyone watches that because everyone wants to find the treasure and so one of the fun things i do in my books is you know i, I weave these in is the golden menorah is it in play is the ark of the covenant in play you know are we going to find those things the holy grail whatever it might be um because i think that's you you need if you're going to have characters motivated to do you know really extraordinary things uh you need to have extraordinary high stakes you need to have high stakes people aren't going to do extraordinary things over you know 20 bucks but if you get the ark of the covenant now you're going to do some crazy things well that's certainly the line that you're going down uh let me just kind of bounce a couple of things off you that i've been working on and, and kind of or investigating at the very early stages and i don't have nearly the depth of knowledge that you do so i'm just kind of stumbling through this but i'm kind of intrigued by what you said because i think sometimes we misunderstand the roman agenda as it's 
being disclosed to us. Like uh, Josephus, I think, is a super interesting character, obviously, in that first uprising, right? And Josephus is there, and supposedly he's this Jewish general who fights bravely against the Vespasian who comes in, and he stands him off at a siege, and then he goes in to commit suicide. And the story always gets really flaky at this point, and invariably historians leave the most important part of the story out. And that's that Josephus goes into the cave, they all commit suicide. And then jo Josephus says, hey, He's you know like what? <laughs> I just had a revelation. We should come out. And then he says, Vespasian, you're gonna be the emperor. And then Vespasian takes him under his wing and says, you're a good kid. Come along and write this history down for us because we don't know how to write it. You're the only guy who can write it. I mean, this whole thing is just preposterous. Go ahead. This tell is a really good book talking about this. If you get a chance, it's called The Secret Society of Moses by Barbiero. But yeah, it, it, exactly what you were saying there were, how convenient is it to for Josephus that they, they draw lots and he everyone's got to kill themselves in the order of their lot. And he's the last guy standing and like he's the last one. He says, oh, instead of killing myself, maybe I'll go talk and I'll cut a deal. And essentially what I think happened in this book talks about it and what you hinted at he basically cuts a deal. This is back to, again, Josephus is part of the priestly family and they're the guardians of the temple treasure. And you can ransom yourself out of a lot of predicaments if you've got enough money. And I think what happened is Josephus said to Vesuvius, uh, to Vespasian, sorry, that, um, you know what, I've got this temple treasure and you need it if you want to become emperor. Here it is. Let me come back to Rome with you. And eventually he was adopted into the royal, the royal family, right? Josephus was, even though he was supposed to be a Jewish freedom fighter, all of a sudden he's adopted into the family. Um, and, and, and the treasure is used to bring about the next emperor. And so the deal is made. That's a great point, David. You just added something really cool to that about the treasure. So I'm so glad you did that. But here's the, here's the other thing I want to kind of throw on the table and see what you think, because everyone leaves this out. Josephus not only says, Vespasian, you're going to be the next emperor, which is supposedly prophecy. But he also says the most important thing in terms of a social engineering conspiracy kind of thing, which it just clearly is. Because in his autobiography, Josephus says, hey, I am super Jew. You know, at 14 years old, I was in the temple kind of talking down to the priest, telling him what it is, because I knew the Jewish law so completely, which he kind of contradicts himself later in his works, because he doesn't really even know the Jewish law as he's talking about it. But he wants his readers to think that he's this kind of super Jew from a very exclusive family, and he's seen all the different tribes of, of Israel, and he knows there's the zealots, and he gets along with all of them. It all builds up, because what he says in War of the Jews is that I now understand that our tradition, all our prophecies point to Vespasian as the Messiah. And this is super important. And it's buried because, again, it's one of these things that doesn't fit in the story. Because, like, you gave a very kind of uh, uh, worldly explanation for the negotiation he might have done, which is awesome, about going to get the treasure. But we also have to look at it from a spiritual standpoint, right? This is, after all, a spiritual guy who's speaking to a spiritual religious group. And he's saying, and he never backs down from this, he's saying, Vespasian is the Messiah. He's saying all of our Jewish traditions should be rewritten so that Vespasian and the emperor, and, and this, I think, is really a, a, a turning point for the whole thing because it points to me clearly an attempt to socially engineer, to kind of quell the masses, to re-engineer their religion as a way of controlling that. Do, do you remember coming across that in Josephus? Because I can send you, obviously, the, the exact clip. So I'm, I'm more cynical about it than you are because I think, I think Josephus basically he got religion or spirituality because he was on the verge of having commit suicide. The, the rest of that story, not only did he save himself, but he was able to convince the Romans to free about 200 of his friends and family. Again, you know, these people were all ready to be executed. They were in prison camps or whatever. And he walks in and basically says, you, 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 you. And they're all free and they all get to go back to Rome with him. So I think what happened was, you know, he sold his soul in that situation. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a spiritual transformation. 
it was basically self-preservation. He said, my only chance to get out of this predicament with my friends and family, by the way, we can all go back to Rome and start over again, is I got to sell this guy Vespasian on the, on the belief that I think he's the next, you know, the, the prophesied one, whatever, and, 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 and make it happen. And once I do make it happen, now all of a sudden I'm the favorite son. And it turns out he was, he was adopted into the family. He was given a, his own chalet. He gets to write his, his histories and, you know, things are great, but I guess I'm more cynical about it. I don't think it was spiritual as much as it was self-preservation. So we're kind of saying the same thing kind of a different way, but not maybe not exactly. Because if you take the cynical approach and say that it wasn't a genuine spiritual transformation, which I, I would agree with you, then I think it's hard to uh, not say that it was engineered by the Romans, because this is what the Romans did, right? With every territory, they'd go in and they'd co-opt the people's religion. They'd go in and say, hey, you know what? It turns out you have these gods we have kind of the same God. So, you know, we're really not that different after all. So the idea of uh, this co-opting of your most sacred beliefs as a way of controlling you is kind of well-established. So I think that that becomes the only way to understand Josephus is that he's writing on behalf of the Romans because otherwise he has no he really has no uh, reason to do this, or, or maybe put it a different way. The benefits for Rome, for the potential of doing this are just fantastic. I think one of the reasons that we don't quite grab onto it so much is it's a failed proposition, right? Even though they bring over, he brings over his 200 and they probably bring over 50,000 slaves, there isn't this mass conversion to this new idea that uh, Vespasian is, uh, is the Messiah. The Jews don't leave their religion in, in masses as the second revolt says. But I think to, to understand it as anything less than an attempt to engineer the religion, to, re, to co-opt it, I, 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 to me, that's kind of self-evident. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't think you and I disagree very much on this at all. I, th I think we're basically on the same page. In the end, it didn't, it didn't work. And I think partly because Vespasian died so quickly after that. And, and you know, partly because it's hard, it's hard to convince people that there's a new, it's one thing to convince somebody that, that, that there's a prophecy that, that he's supposed to be the next emperor. It's another thing when you take the next leap into the Messiah. And I know that other 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 Roman leaders tried to do that, but but that's a that's a tougher leap, and I you know it like it, it worked like it, Jesus was able to accomplish it, so it was a time period for this kind of thing to have happened. I don't and, think you and I are too far apart. Yeah, and uh, you know the whole thing about Jesus, which I don't want to get into because it kind of d distracts from the whole conversation, but I, I think this part does cause us to look at. Uh, the Jesus narrative differently as well, because now they've tried it. They've tried engineering the religion. It doesn't work. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, we wind up with a lot. Josephus is all over the place, right? Josephus's historical accounts now show up as prophecy. Jesus is saying line for line almost right out of the war of the Jews, only now it's coming out as prophecy rather than uh, uh, an historical account. So the, the, what the scholars will say, the biblical scholars will say is the gospels are dependent on Josephus. It looks like they had access to Josephus, at least during some rewrites of them that, because it's so closely tied to Josephus. But it, it, in order to kind of shift it back to your book, Romerica, and what you're speculating about in terms of the second uprising in the second century, what do we think is, how big of an uprising is it? Because the other thing I'm kind of stumbling across is that like Josephus, when he writes that, I think he has a tendency to exaggerate how big of a deal it was. I mean, the Romans are all about going into foreign lands and then, you know, they'll get their ass kicked for a little while and then they'll just come back and they'll siege the thing and, you know, they'll send in a couple yeah. hundred thousand troops and it'll be over. I mean, how many, so first of all, hard, hard numbers. Do you know how many Roman legions they sent into Jerusalem to put down 
the second rebellion? I think there were eight or nine. So that would be 80 or 90,000 troops, so the Ninth Legion being one of them. So what you said is, is totally correct. I mean, eventually the Romans are just going to just going to bulldoze you over. I mean, we saw that in the first rebellion with the uh, with the assault on the Mossad, the the desert fortress out in the you know the high. Eventually, you just they just built a, a ramp and, and, and mowed them over. But it takes time, and so and again, that's what happened during the Bar Kopka uprising. Is is that eventually you just you just can't fight them off any longer. They're too too massive a force, too well trained. Um, I do want to just circle back for a second back to to some of the evidence about. Um, we, we, we talked about the, the Hanukkah fort, but there's also a fascinating artifact in Tennessee, which ties us all together. I don't want to get off before we're done. And that's something called the Bat Creek Stone. If you remember, I said that the, that the battle cry for the Bar Kopka revolt was a comet for the Jews. And there's a, a stone carving that was found by a Smithsonian archeologist in the late 1800s that was displayed at the Smithsonian uh, upside down for for a number of decades because I thought it was Cherokee script. It was found in a burial mound and it was carbon dated. Artifacts with it, there we go, were carbon dated back to the second century. Um, in the 1950s, a Jewish scholar went in and, and sort of turned her head upside down and said, "Wait a second, that's upside down. That's Paleo Hebrew, second century Hebrew, and that says a comet for the Jews." And so this was like a, a, a huge thing because I had known about this artifact for quite a while, and it's always been one of those outliers. But now we've got the actual Bar Kopka uprising battle cry carved on an artifact in the Ohio River Valley that we know dates back to the second century. We've also got coins in the Ohio River Valley that are Roman, including, in particular, a Bar Kopka uprising coin. Uh, those are the ones from the North Shore of Massachusetts. I'm not sure if I gave you a picture of the uh, and those are also North Shore, but the, it, it, there's an actual Bar Kopka coin. So we have not just Roman artifacts in the Ohio River Valley, but we have very specific artifacts that tie exactly to the Bar Kopka uprising. And to me, that's what, that's what sort of pushes over the edge. It's like, wow, we not only have Roman stuff, but we have second century Judaica stuff. The, also the, 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 the Decalogue, so the Ten Commandments don't. Again, the Ten Commandments written around this, it's almost like a channel clicker like thing it says the Ten Commandments and Moses in it but again there's no reason for the Romans to have fashioned these artifacts there had to have been Jews with them and so we have these Jewish artifacts again carbon dating the stand to the second century tells us exactly when that was carved okay so Dave let's start pulling together some of the pieces this is fun and it's kind of on the fly and I'm just picking your brain because you know this stuff. I feel like any anywhere I go, you're going to have like 10 new ideas. So the Ninth Legion shows up. And I even want to say like one of the things that's interesting in that and that when you start studying it, you immediately, it ties back into this uh, Atlantic barrier, right? These guys are floating all around. You know, one day they're up in Scotland, the next thing, oh, redeploy over to uh, Jerusalem. Okay, no problem, right. swing it's down. I mean- yeah, that, that, that's a tough trip, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, no, it's not crossing the Atlantic, but, you know, it's like just to just to have kind of a routine redeployment. It's not like the end of the world to move the Ninth Legion down there. But what I really wanted to ask- And, you, and, and that, that's why it took the Romans so long to put these rebellions down. It took, you know, months and months or even years to get your troops deployed. Eventually you're gonna win, but it just takes a, it takes a while to, to get everything together. So yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, no, exactly. Because this uh, this time thing is super important, as you point out. The other thing about that, like you said, is that, you know, the people in the know, the upper class, the ruling class, the give unto Rome what is Rome, playing the smart moves, like you said, they're looking this and that, okay, they're going to mow us down, right? So that's going to happen. How do you think it works out if there are eight or nine legions there? Number one, do you really, do you think that might be a bit of an exaggeration? Do you think there's any chance that the ninth legion either gets there first and kind of makes a deal or because how would they make a deal with all the other legions being there? Is there another part of that story maybe that we're not getting? You know, I don't, I don't know. We're speculating here, but I think it's, you know, somebody has got to be the legion that happens to take the 
temple while other legions are doing mop up duty in the suburbs and other legions are out at Masada or whatever, you know, it's just, somebody has got to be the legion that happens to be there that day. And, 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 and the priestly families are cowering in the corner saying, time out, we got a waving our, wed, uh, waving our white flag saying, we surrender, we want to make a deal. And now the deal is, okay, let us live. And we've got access to all this gold and silver and treasure. And we want to buy our freedom. You got to take us with you. And then it requires somebody in that ninth legion to say, deal, as opposed to no way we're bringing it back to the emperor. So there's, you know, there's a human element involved in this as well. But for whatever reason, I think the pieces fell together that day. It happened to be the right people making the right deal. There was enough treasure to, to grease the skids. They somehow knew where to go. They had either been blown off courts earlier or somehow knew about this land across the Atlantic. Uh, somebody had maybe had been there. Maybe, uh, don't forget the Roman legions were comprised of the conquered Phoenician and Carthaginian groups. So they, 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 you know, they're like the Borg in Star Trek. They basically, they, they just take everybody in and that becomes who they are. And so to the extent they would have, the Ninth Legion, by the way, was based in the Iberian Peninsula. So they would have had plenty of members who have family experience as part of the, the Punic Wars and the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians and history of, of crossing the Atlantic and navigating all that, all those skills would have been part of the Ninth Legion. So, yeah, again, this is speculative, but the pieces are no, no, together. No, it's great. Can, can you speak to uh, the independence or, or of, the, of the different legions? You know, again, this is kind of an interesting time period. So Vespasian <laughs> follows Nero, and not directly because in between Vespasian and Nero is this famous, the four emperors in a year kind of thing which we all kind of gloss over and we talk about these eras, like you were talking about the, you know, Obama, Trump, Biden era, you know, you know, like these are completely different people and all this, but we kind of, it, with our lens, we kind of just put them all down as one thing. But imagine four different emperors in a year. And when Vespasian takes over, I know I'm going back a little bit, but this is the part that I know, it's, it's a military thing, right? his soldiers kind of promote him because in the streets of Rome, there's basically these different legions fighting over who is going to control and who is going to take power. So what have you right. learned about particularly, you know, the ninth legion? Are, there, are they these kind of breakaway, kind of do it our own way kind of guys? Does it fit? Does what you're suggesting fit their personality? one point on Vespasian, the reason his soldiers are so loyal to him is because he was able to pay them. You know, a lot of the times these guys don't get paid. All of a sudden he's got the temple treasures. He can start handing out bonuses and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, Vespasian, okay. So that makes sense, right? You follow the money, okay? As far as the Ninth Legion goes, uh, the Ninth Legion had been stationed in, in England for a couple of generations. I don't know the number of decades, many decades. And so many of them were, were, were English in the sense that they spoke Welsh, they, they, they had uh, quote unquote English cultural attributes and whatnot. And so when they go off to the Middle East to put down the rebellion, they have no interest in staying there. They probably have no real ties to Rome at that point. They've been generations worth of them. They've married local women in England. They've, their kids have been raised in England. Maybe they've been raised in England. So they're already inclined to go back and not stay in the Mediterranean area because they're basically English. And what we find when we get to America uh, the, the, in, in, in the Ohio River Valley, not just Roman stuff, we find uh, artifacts with Welsh writing on it. So, and, and Welsh armor, Welsh skeletons. So we find a lot of stuff that ties back to England because that's where the Ninth Legion was based. And a lot of their cultural attributes were English or Welsh. And so that, again, that part of the story ties together, but it goes back to your question, which is the Ninth Legion, even though they're quote unquote Roman, doesn't mean they're Italian. It just means they're part of this umbrella that was the Roman Empire, which essentially encompassed most or all of Europe and Middle East and Af Northern Africa. I mean, it's huge. So to be Roman back then really just meant part of an empire, but that wasn't your ethnicity, ethnicity necessarily. So Dave, we could, uh, we could go on and on and I could try and pepper you with questions and learn more and more. But as far as the book, 
Romerica, Roman Facts in America, which again is a great read and you can get the Kindle version for five bucks or unlimited. If you're Kindle unlimited, you can actually read it for free. Yep. You can check out all By the way, days. I'm not sure, authors, authors make a nice uh, royalty even when readers do it from Kindle Unlimited. I don't know if you knew that or not, but um, yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm uh, indifferent as to whether pe people buy the Kindle or, or read it on Kindle Unlimited. I, I, you know, I basically make the same. So not that I do this necessarily for the money. I try to make these books affordable, but you're not taking anything out of an author's pocket if you read it on Kindle Unlimited. Great. Great to know. I thought it was a little bit less, uh, especially since uh, marginally. It's not. It's not a big difference. Okay, great. So you know, please do check out uh, Dave's work, all his other great books. Uh, what What else do we want to tell people? Do we want to leave them with in terms of Romerica? I, I, I realize we haven't talked about it. I think we talked about it a lot. But what else do we do? Well, it's a lot of, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, as you said, Kindle or paperback version. Uh, I, I try to keep them affordable, as you said, 15 bucks for the paperback and less than five bucks for the Kindle. I can make a lot more money practicing law if that's what I was doing it for. You know, that's not my agenda, but my, I, but I am passionate about this and I do want other people to start focusing in on the idea that the history that we've been taught really isn't as accurate as it could be and that there are waves of explorers who've been crossing the Atlantic long before Columbus. I think that's an important part of understanding who we are and what the what the world history is, um, so you know I, I always want to sort of make that commentary at the end. But um, I love to hear from readers if you have any feedback, if you have questions, if you if you have artifacts. I think one of the things we didn't talk about today, and I'll talk real quickly, is just two days ago I got an email from a guy down in in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia who found uh, an ancient uh, ironworks. Uh, facility there and he carbon dated the bricks he, he, he did uh, luminescence testing on the bricks second century and he was always already convinced that they were roman and this guy came back second century and he was all excited because my research bookends his and i'm all excited because there's another artifact and so you know readers if you read my stuff and you've got stuff in your backyard give me a call let me know because it might all fit together another puzzle piece to add to, add it to the gestalt there yeah, absolutely. I'd go so far as to say this is the the future of really the, the breakthrough work in this area. And we have to kind of recondition ourselves and say goodbye to academia because every once in a while they'll stumble on something and it'll trickle out of their corrupt machine. But really, this is the way that information is going to go is going to come out. And I think we just need to change our focus and not be so surprised, you know, oh my God. You know, Dave Brody, an attorney, has written this. We have to go, no, the other system is completely corrupt and completely rigged to pro project a certain narrative. So yeah, that's where you would expect it to come out. Yeah, you know, the, the Lonsal Meadow site in Northern Newfoundland, they were amateur archeologists. He was an attorney that, that you know, they had to drag the mainstream archeology span community kicking and screaming up there. You know, they wouldn't, didn't want to come look at it, but. It's, it seems to be, like you said, it seems to always be the amateurs who are pushing the, pushing the envelope on this and, 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 the, and the professionals who will get dragged along, you know, hesit hesitantly. But yeah, I, th I think you're right about that, Alex. I think, I think this is the wave. This kind of research is the wave of the future. Dave, great work. And thanks again so much for joining me on Skeptico. It's been great. My pleasure. You're a great host. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Dave Brody for joining me on Skeptico. Check out his book, Romerica. I think you really enjoy it. It's a great read. And as I mentioned, a lot of great historical references and links. If you have the Kindle version, you just tap and you can go right over to the real archaeological finds and other information that he has in there. So do check that out. Question to tee up from this interview. Oh boy, I don't even know where to begin. Maybe this one, a simple one. How fake do you think this history is? And part two, Skeptico second level is, why is it fake? Why is this history so fake? Why do they care about keeping this history fake? Oh boy, I'm tipping my hand in where I intend to go on this stuff. Let me know your thoughts. Talk to me. Talk to me out there, Skeptical Forum, or wherever you reach me. Lots of shows coming up. Till next time.
Take care and bye for now.